One day, about 20 years ago, I had succeeded in the execution of one of my first communications plans. I was very proud and happy to receive the congratulatory comments from my boss, the manager of the communications team. I don't actually remember what my manager said or more likely wrote to me, but I do remember the CEO of the corporation took the time to send me an email, and I remember exactly what the CEO wrote. Way to go, build the plan, execute the plan. That simple phrase has stuck with me throughout my career. Take your time early in the process to build a plan, build a blueprint, and then don't let distractions or impulses pull you from the plan. Stick to the plan. Now, my CEO obviously intended that comment as kind of a fairly simple and shallow, boy." They were such an impressive leader to me that their comments made a much deeper impression. And I interpreted a false meaning. Plans help you get started. They're meant as guidelines, but they are seldom a set of rules. They are not DNA. And even if they were, There's an emerging new scientific field called epigenetics, exploring chemical tags on DNA that have the ability to turn our genes on or off in response to environmental stimuli. In other words, there is nothing not subject to change. Today on Stories and Strategies, using epigenetics as both a metaphor and a literal learning that your destiny is not set The plan is a good starting point, and success is yours to engineer. My name is Doug Downs, and this is episode four of our leadership series. My guest today is Jason Krauss, author of the book, The Science Behind Success. Hi, Jason. Hi, Doug. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm glad we were finally able to get together. We've been working on this for for a little while. Um, Jason, yeah. you're, and you're you're actually joining us today close to my home in the Rocky Mountains. You're in Calgary, Canada. How are things in Calgary today? They are great. Warming up. We've had a cold snap that we're coming out of, and so it uh, it's well received. Absolutely. Jason, you are the founder of Level 52 Inc., a boutique leadership and executive coaching firm that's based in Calgary, but it has a global reach. You've worked with leaders in Asia, the United States, and Level 52 has won several awards for learning and development. And going back a bit further, you started your leadership and high performance path as a Canadian national bobsled pilot. Jason, let's start first with um, a real definition of epigenetics. I'm, I'm a bit of, as I say, a science nerd. Um, and this is, I had not heard of this. So read a lot about it before we'd actually agreed to do the interview together. This is very new and it's very, very real. There is lots of science behind this. Help me understand what epigenetics is. The, the simplest uh, definition is that epigenetics explains why culture eats strategy for breakfast and as that famous peter drucker quote and what epigenetics is it's the definition is your traits that are resulting from external influences rather than internal influences and so really it's it's the science that is learning more and more about the nature versus nurture debate and we all grew up with in that genetics is your destiny type of lens in science. And what epigenetics is showing us is there's far more to that story. Which has such positives and such potentially personal negatives. If you uh, live in an immediate surrounding that does not have positive reinforcement, the impact to you for the rest of your life is substantial that way. Well, there's a, there's a blessing and a curse to everything, right? Ignorance is bliss. And one of the, one of the important elements of epigenetics, the further you get into it is knowing that once you become aware that you're accountable for your environment, then you become really accountable for your environment. You tell a story in your book about Samuel Pierpoint Langley and the Wright brothers, all three trying to invent what would become the airplane. Langley had all the tools, all the money, all the resources. Langley should have been the one, should have been in our textbooks, is not. Because the Wright brothers 
they defied the so-called DNA here. And they, how did they accomplish this? And how does this tie back to epigenetics? We all get stuck in thinking that we need more things, that there's a cause and effect of if I have this, then I can create that. And it's a very seductive trap. And Langley is a great example. You know, metaphorically, he had all the DNA he needed to deliver on the airplane, the funding, the people behind it, like had everything that most people would say, this is what I need to be successful. Whereas it's a great contrast When you have these two uneducated brothers from Kitty Hawk who don't have the resources, but they have a critical input, and that is they've got the unwavering passion to make this thing happen. You know, that's one of the one story of many that really help ground what epigenetics is showing us the the classic nature versus nurture discussion. What epigenetics shows us is the DNA. That what we make up is the building block of success and expression isn't the full story. So in one sense, one entity had the blueprint, the plan. Boy, they built the plan that would succeed. Like my little story off the top, build the plan, execute the plan. But there's more to it. It's in the execution that so much can be learned. And actually, that's where success is actually ar- arrived at. It's in the execution. And even to take that a step further, what informs the execution is the different layers of culture that help create the momentum that uh, that fulfills the desired expression of that plan. Otherwise, like plans just simply aren't enough. You take us back to a year ago. If you're like me, we had a plan for our business. It was going to be the best year yet. And then what happened? Our plan was irrelevant once COVID came. That little story I told off the top, very sincere. I had learned to build a plan, then execute it. Um, You would call that from your book, strategic determinism, similar to genetic determinism. The idea that my genes have already decided how tall I will be, what I will look like, who I am to become. You have a similar story in your book about being too tightly wound from early in your career? Mm -hmm. There, it's so funny looking back now. I, of course, I wish I could have seen it at the time, but I was so tightly wound. I was in the best physical shape of my life, but yet Even though I had previous results, I was going into the Olympic year in 2006, there were events that really had me tightly wound. So that even though I was in the best physical shape, I couldn't deliver on the results. And so what was it that had me tightly wound? Well, a couple of things. I had just lost my best friend to cancer and was in grief, in reaction. I... I was going into the Olympic year in preservation mode, right? Like just do enough, Jason, to to make that standard to go to the Olympics. And so I was so tightly wound, burdened with grief and the pressure I put on myself. I was caught in a place of destination-itis. Of course, I didn't realize this at the time, but I made up a story that when I get to the Olympics, then I'm going to be really important. And all of this led to just a collapse where I thought I was going to the Olympics and was going to compete for a great result. Here I was February watching my teammates march into the stadium at opening ceremonies. And I was left there in a puddle of my own tears. Mm. Translating that over to the communications in the corporate world, is, is there a chance that we put too much pressure on those we designate to build plans? Well, I think that's a, that's a big trap. And a lot of leaders actually now that, that we work with moved, are moving to, to more agile strategic plans, right? More of that build, measure, learn. Let's put the emphasis on learning quicker so that we can choose where to turn off resources, where to turn them on. And I'm talking about cognitive, uh, economic resources, people resources, everything. And, but that's it. The old way of strategic determinism is not enough. Where we need to be four years from now. While vision is a benefit, like any structure, if you over-index it and think that that's the path, then it's just going to put you in a place of risk. Here's, Here's one of the really hard parts. In the corporate world today, it is extremely rare that people have 
or feel they have, the flexibility to think and move outside the box. There are more often than not multiple layers of approval to change any existing plan. You have the plan, execute the plan. How hard it must be for those of us who have to report upward and are suggesting, hey, I think we ought to go left a little here and not necessarily right. There are a combination of things inside organizations. There are the structures, the processes that prevent people from expressing themselves. The most productive place to focus when you're looking at working with the individual leader is the part that you said at the beginning. I feel like I can't do this. And we create clear distinctions between the way you perceive yourself. You're either an object of your environment, which has you wait for approvals, wait to be told what I can or can't do, or you become an agent of expression, innovation. And the difference is an object goes to their boss and says, can I get approval for this? Versus an agent goes and says, what do you need to see in order to approve this? Right? It's a little thing that makes a big difference. And in the world of high performance, meaningful performance, while everyone's searching for the magic bullets to activate expression and change, it, it is the little things, the little inputs that influence a greater expression. Wow. And just listening to, you know, and, and I've been the leader for structures within an organization and those employees who would come to me, my direct reports and say, I think this, what do I need to do um, for you to agree to this? How much I appreciated that it, in part because I just bought into the conviction that they had knowing they were deeper in the grass blades than I was on whatever the issue was. Exactly. And, and great leaders can spot that and create that in their team. That's where, like, as a leader, you're responsible for creating the conditions for success and activating that expression in your workforce. For example, one of our, one of the former participants in one of our programs, he's completely disbanded management meetings in his organization. <laughs> and, and he's created leadership and strategy meetings where anyone in the organization can come and, and put themselves into a committee to create change in the organization. And he said it's one of the best things they've ever done, that their organization now is rapidly evolving, and you've got a level of engagement that they've never seen before. I don't know, Jason, that sounds like chaos to me. Well, it is chaos, but every great transformation happens through chaos. A, a quote a friend said to me, the catalyst for change is either by design or by disaster. And so here's someone who's created chaos inside the organization so that they can stay relevant, get ahead of the game. The democratization of organizations is going to happen more and more where the decisions aren't just made at the top, but let's leverage the intellectual capability of all of our people and, and generate a greater influence of our organizational DNA. A long, long time ago, I had a, it was a job interview, actually not long after that little story that I told off the top. And the interviewer asked me, Doug, have you ever broken the rules? And, and in hindsight now, I know I answered it all wrong because I spoke to the value of identifying the plan and executing the plan and living by the rules. But th the truth is sometimes you do have to break the rules or deviate from the plan in order to achieve success. Aaron Brockovich, the real life Aaron Brockovich is testament to that idea. Here's a scene from the 2000 movie starring Julia Roberts, distributed by Universal Pictures in North America and Sony Pictures everywhere else. In this scene, Aaron is on the verge of a breakthrough, but she hasn't been following the plan. She, she hasn't been coming into work, so she gets fired. Where's my stuff? Where have you been? What did you do with my stuff? Don't you use language like that with Who do you think you are, Miss Lady? Someone took my stuff. Nice to see you, Erin. I, I have missed photos you. of my kids, a mug, a toothbrush, toothpaste, mousse, and deodorant. Here. What's going on? Well, there may be jobs where you can disappear for days at a time, but this isn't one of them. Here, you don't do the work, you don't get to stay. I've been working. That's all I've been doing. Ask Mr. Masry, he knows. You ask Mr. Masry. He fired you. You said to fire me? I'll call you back. You've been gone for a week. I left a 
message. I've been dealing with this real estate thing. I was going to write a whole damn report. Well, that's not how we work here. You don't just uh, leave a message and take off. Well, what am I supposed to do? Check in every two seconds? Yes, it's called accountability. I'm not talking to you, Excuse me! Get out that's of my enough. face! Look, Aaron, this uh, incident aside, I don't think this is the right uh, place for you. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is make a few calls on your behalf and find something else. Okay? Don't bother. Well, come on, I'm trying to help. Bull you're trying to make yourself feel less guilty about firing someone with three kids to feed. Well, I'm going to help you do that. Well, there's so many things in that, in that clip. One, as a leader, do you want robots or do you want agents? Right. Robots show up and do what they're told, what they're programmed to do. Absolutely. Agents create innovation. And I think the hardest thing for leaders, if they aren't clear about their approach, it is understanding deviance breeds innovation. Like what you said about breaking rules. You have to break your own rules in order to facilitate innovation. And that is hard. That's why one of the principles um, for us is, is meaningful masochism like really deliberately engaging in the pain that you know is coming because you see where it can take you. So, so let's take this to that leadership level. In that case, Aaron's boss was right to respond to Aaron not showing up for work. That can't actually be accepted. That there's, I don't know of any system where that works. Um, how is one to lead if the employees are not running the play that they are supposed to run? Well, there are a couple things. One, as a leader, you step back and you ask yourself, well, this is the play that I called um, and it wasn't run the way that I wanted. And so do I course correct it or do I understand why the play wasn't run the way that I wanted, right? It, most leaders will go to, you know, course correcting why you didn't run the play, where a meaningful leader is going to come in, get some more data to operate. M maybe there's something I'm not seeing. You know, I've coached high school football before, and the classic approach is when the, when the offense comes off the field, you tell them what was on the field and you tell them what they need to do next. But when you look through the lens of epigenetics, activating the expression, what are the little things that you can do better? Well, they come off the field and you start asking them questions. What fronts did you see? What was the coverage? How did they shift to motion? Based on what you see, what do you think we need to come out with next? It has them thinking about the process rather than being the robot that you're training to run the play. The simplest way to explain epigenetics is to look at the same DNA and three different expressions. There's no difference genetically between a caterpillar, a cocoon, and a butterfly, but yet they're remarkably different expressions. Well, we are, we are the same way. Every day we wake up. Sometimes, depending on the situation, my mood, my mindset, I show up slow and sloppy doing what I do. Sometimes I show up isolated, working in a silo, or some say a cylinder of excellence, depending on how you look at it. Or the last one is as taking the butterfly as the equivalent of the greater expression of myself. Well, what is it that has my DNA show up differently? And that's the job for you as a leader and you as a human to identify the inputs that influence your expression, as well as the different layers, the people on your team and your organization. One of my favorite stories in the epigenetic section in my book is about a story of link, uh, a story about an employee at LinkedIn. There was a young woman at LinkedIn in the accounting and finance department who had desires to get into other areas, but she naturally went to, a, uh, she created a narrative that says, well, I can't do that. I don't have the experience to go into product development. I've been in accounting my whole career. That's imposter syndrome, isn't it? Yes, exactly. But her mentor said, you know what? I disagree. And here's why. Why don't you apply and see where you go? So she did. And of course, if she was outside the organization, she wouldn't have gotten an interview, but she networked her way to getting an interview. Well, guess what? She got the job. And funny enough, the, the DNA, lacking expertise, she shouldn't have been successful. But a year later, she ended up leading the most successful product development team inside of LinkedIn. Wow. Wow. Jason, it was just great to get together with you today. 
Thank you, Doug. It's great to share my stories. We have a, a link in the show notes for folks that want to access your book, The Science Behind Success. Uh, so we'll put a link to those in the show notes. Yeah, thanks, Doug. I appreciate it. If you'd like to send a message to my guest, Jason Kraus, you can email him best through his website. Uh, and again, there's a link in the show notes. It's level52.ca backslash contact. If you liked what you heard today, we're hoping you choose to subscribe to Stories and Strategies and receive updated episodes automatically. You can follow us on Twitter. It's at comms underscore podcast. We're also hoping you choose to follow and rate this podcast on any directory you're listening on. And of course, do us a favor, just recommend this podcast to one friend if you have an idea for an episode and this leadership series in march was a suggestion from a colleague send us a note at info at jgrcommunications.com thanks for listening